Let's talk about alkaloids. This is sections 18.4 and 18.5. Alkaloids are defined as a naturally occurring amine. So that means that it comes from a plant or it comes from an animal. Um, or alkaloids can also include synthetic human-made versions of naturally occurring amines. So an alkaloid is, is a naturally occurring amine that causes a physiological response. So that means that it does something when we take it, we eat it or smoke it or uh, inject it or whatever, and it causes some sort of noticeable change to one of the systems in our body. Like maybe it makes you sleepy or maybe it makes you alert or maybe it reduces your fever or reduces pain or reduces inflammation or something along those lines. That is the definition of an alkaloid. And we're going to look at a few interesting alkaloids, starting with caffeine. So this is a naturally occurring molecule that can be extracted from coffee plants, tea plants, and even cocoa. There's not a whole lot in cocoa. It is a mild stimulant, I'm sure you know, and it is technically addictive, but it is a very mild addiction. So when you want to break your addiction to caffeine, it's not very physically difficult to do that. When we say that something is addictive, the, the technical definition of addictive is that it causes um, some sort of restructuring to the, to, the, um, to the brain. So addictive isn't in the sense of like it makes you do things that you wouldn't normally do or engage in some sort of inappropriate behavior or whatever. Addictive means that your brain is restructured as a result of repeated and prolonged use of the substance, and then your brain then becomes chemically dependent or chemically expectant on receiving this particular substance. So caffeine is addictive, um, and I, we are going to talk about the mechanism of the addiction. It enters our blood bloodstream through our small intestine because, you know, we're eating it. And so once it gets into your small intestine, that's how it gets into your blood. And then once it gets into your blood, it goes from your blood into your brain, which is where it does its magic. Caffeine in our brain mimics the structure of a molecule that we have in our brain called adenosine. So here I have, over here I have the structures of both caffeine and adenosine. And you can see that this part of the adenosine molecule is pretty similar to the structure of the caffeine molecule. The uh, adenosine molecule in our brain is associated with the feeling, our feeling of tiredness. So inside our brain, we have these little receptors or kind of like little parking lots all over in our brain. And they are designed for adenosine molecules to just kind of park into these little receptors. These little receptors, they just fit an adenosine molecule perfectly in them. And so when we absorb adenosine into these receptors, so when our receptors get filled up with these little adenosine molecules, then it makes us feel sleepy. So we get tired. So what caffeine does in our body is that caffeine gets up in there and it just sits in these receptors and it blocks them. And it's just kind of like they're just, they're just hanging out in there. Absorbing caffeine does not make us feel tired. Um, so when we have these caffeine molecules that are sitting inside of these receptors and we have all this adenosine running around inside of our brain with nowhere to go because the caffeine molecules are in the way, the adenosine is not being absorbed and therefore we are staying wide awake. And that, that's how it works as a stimulant to help us stay awake. Also, in addition to that, side, another side effect is that if you get a large accumulation of adenosine in your brain, your brain knows that that's not right, that something is wrong. And so it does give, it initiates kind of a fight or flight type response or it produces adrenaline, which also contributes to you feeling awake. And that can lead to, you know, sort of like a jittery feeling that you get when you're taking a lot of caffeine and you're getting a lot of adenosine accumulating in your brain.
So if you use caffeine for a long time, especially if you're using it like the same time of the day every day, our brain says, you know, this is kind of lame because you've got all these adenosine receptors in your brain and your brain, you are filling them up with caffeine molecules because you're drinking caffeine. So you've got all these free floating adenosines in your body, in your brain, and your brain doesn't like to have the adenosines free floating in your body. So your brain says, no problem. I'm going to build some more receptors. And so it just builds more receptors. And then these extra adenosine molecules, now they have a place to go. And so when once our body starts building all these extra receptors, that is the definition of addiction. Our brain has been altered to accommodate the caffeine. And so now if you want to stay awake, you have to drink more coffee to block these receptors. So these adenosine molecules can't go there. And your brain responds by building more receptors and you respond by drinking more coffee and it's just kind of a vicious cycle. But it repairs itself really fast. So if you decide, you know what, this is too much, I'm not gonna do caffeine anymore and you stop, just stop drinking it, your brain will actually just start to tear down all of those extra receptors that it built. It'll just take them away takes a couple weeks, but eventually it'll just go back to normal and you'll have the same number of receptors that you originally had and your adenosine molecules can just park themselves right in them and everything is fine. So that's a very easy habit to break. Nicotine, not quite so easy. Um, so here's the structure of the nicotine molecule. This is also a natural product comes from the tobacco plant. In small doses, it's a stimulant. Stimulant, And interestingly enough, in large doses, nicotine is actually a depressant. We all know that nicotine is addictive and people who have addiction to nicotine, a lot of them say that it is the most difficult addiction. There are a lot of different resources out there that rank the level of addictiveness of various substances. And nicotine is always very high, if not number one on the list, depending on whatever criteria they're using. Nicotine goes into our bloodstream and then into our brain from our bloodstream, just like caffeine, and it acts in our brain, similar to caffeine. Nicotine mimics a molecule called acetylcholine. This, this is the acetylcholine molecule, and it's this portion of the nicotine molecule that somewhat matches up with the acetylcholine molecule. Acetylcholine is a molecule um, that, like adenosine, that our brains naturally produce. Acetyl, and, and it's one that we um, have receptors for, just like adenosine. So we have these receptors inside our brain that are designed for the acetylcholine. And when we absorb acetylcholine, the absorption of acetylcholine leads to successful respiration, heart rate, memory, muscle movement. So these are so pretty more significant biological functions than tiredness. You know, this is like keeping your heart beating and keeping your lungs breathing and, and really important things. So when you consume nicotine, nicotine fits into these acetylcholine receptors, much like caffeine fits into the adenosine receptors. However, Nicotine actually stimulates the acetylcholine receptors. That is different from what caffeine does. When caffeine fits into the adenosine receptor, it just sits there and it doesn't do anything. It doesn't trigger anything to happen. It just prevents something else from happening. When nicotine sits into an acetylcholine receptor, our body perceives it and responds just as if it was acetylcholine. So, nicotine then is, you know, being absorbed and is contributing to respiration, heart rate, memory, muscle movement, all these types of things. So it's doing the job of acetylcholine. And um, that, that, makes, that makes it quite a bit more different than caffeine. So when you consume nicotine for a long period of time, and nicotine is getting into these receptors doing the job of acetylcholine, and you do have some extra acetylcholine out here, um, your, your brain thinks, your brain doesn't know the difference between these two guys, it's confused. So your brain thinks that it's got enough acetylcholine and it stops 
producing as much acetylcholine as normal. So it slows down and releases less acetylcholine. And if you're consuming a lot of nicotine, it'll start destroying some of the receptors as well to try to slow down um, the increased heart rate or increased respiration that might be happening when you're flooding it with, with flooding your brain with nicotine. So once this starts happening, especially the part where your brain is releasing less acetylcholine, once this starts happening, you are now addicted to nicotine because your brain has restructured itself to accommodate the nicotine. And unfortunately, this is a much more significantly difficult addiction to rebuild. So first of all, the rebuilding and repairing, rebuilding receptors, and then also um, getting your brain to release a more normal amount of acetylcholine, that takes a long time. I don't know how well you can see this, up to a year. Some people say it takes even longer, so that, that's significant. Part of the problem with this is that the symptoms that you feel when you're withdrawing from nicotine are not tiredness. Like if you start, if you've got these receptors and your heart rate is dependent on nicotine coming into your body and going into those receptors, when you stop using nicotine and your receptors are empty, your brain is telling you like, I need to stay alive. You need to give me some nicotine because I need it for my heart to beat and for my lungs to work and for my memory to work. So your brain's drive to consume nicotine is much more significant than your brain's drive to consume caffeine. It's the difference between being tired and being alive. So the cravings are, are tremendously difficult for people to overcome. And, and we can understand why, because we understand why nicotine does what it does. And I think that is fascinating. So here's a couple more classes classes of alkaloids. These are, this is, so this is a set of drugs. We call these the local anesthetic alkaloids. As you know, um, alkalo anesthetic means that it is a pain reliever, uh, hopefully total number. A local anesthetic means that it only acts on a limited area. So basically wherever the drug is administered, that's where the pain will be reduced. If you have a local anesthetic put in your mouth, that's the only place where you experience numbness or pain reduction. And the alkaloid, of course, meaning that it, it comes from a plant. So these are the most common local anesthetic alkaloids. You've probably heard of all of these. Lidocaine, which is an over-the-counter Cocaine, which you may only associate as an illegal drug, but cocaine does have legitimate medical purpose, uh, medical uses. It's still used today. Ear, nose, and throat doctors love using cocaine. It's a very uh, love giving cocaine, love having, how do you say that? The ear, nose, and throat doctors really find cocaine to be an effective local anesthetic for their patients. <laughs> And Novocaine, which is um, also used in dentistry. The, the um, cocaine, one of the, the side effects of cocaine, the reason why it becomes problematic societally is that in addition to doing its anesthetic jobs, it also causes our brain to accumulate dopamine. And dopamine is a, a drug that our brain produces that makes us feel really happy. So in addition to numbing, which is not really why, why addicts use cocaine, um, it gives us a dopamine rush, which is why people get addicted to cocaine and use it recreationally. These are the opiate alkaloids. Opiate meaning that they came from the uh, opium molecule, which is extracted from the poppy plant. And I'm sure you've heard of all of these as well, morphine, codeine, and heroin. heroin. So these are our more hardcore pain relievers. And oxycodone, which is not natural. This is synthetic but it is, as you can see, the structure, is, it's derived from these natural opiates. It has the same structure. All of these are highly addictive. They, um, whatever they do inside our brains, they give us a rush of a very good feeling. They are also extremely good pain relievers. This is one of the reasons that we have such an opiate crisis in this country. So these drugs are prescribed because of their effectiveness as pain medication but because of their ability to give us a euphoric sensation, they're also 
simultaneously very, very frequently misused. They're easy for us to get our hands on, and they're also very easy for us to become addicted to. Then last but not least, we have the benzodiazepine barbiturates. A barbiturate is a sedative. Benzodiazepines are these molecules that are called, they're defined as heterocyclics. Tranquilizer, you know what tranquilizer means. It's like sedative. Heterocyclic means that it has these rings and the rings have atoms inside of them that are not carbon. So for example, we've got nitrogens that are part of the ring. So that's what makes it a hetero cycle. Hetero meaning that there are different atoms that um, are making up the ring. These benzodiazepines are also are addictive, not like opiates, but they are addictive. They are prescribed as anti-anxiety medication. Um, so they make us feel sedated. They slow down any kind of nervous jitteriness inside of our brain. They are naturally present, uh, or GABA, which is naturally present in our, in our brain. Um, so this is just sort of boosting and enhancing our natural sedative tranquilizing molecules in our brain. And these are, these are the ones that are most commonly prescribed, Valium, Ativan, Xanax, and Clonopin. I don't know what happened to the in. Those are the trademarked names. If you look at the um, generic names, you'll see they all have the same, their names all sound the same, Diazepam, Lorazepam, Alprazolam, Clonazepam. Uh, so those are those are all of the interesting alkaloids that we're going to talk about in section 18.4 and 18.5.